Welcome to the le next uh, lecture in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. This lecture will cover Bitcoin wallets. Um, we'll talk about types of wallets. We'll talk about hierarchical deterministic wallets and hierarchical keys. We'll talk about derivation of private and public keys and extended keys. And we'll talk about key identifiers and using T keys. The word wallet is used to describe a few different things in Bitcoin. At a high level, a wallet's an application that serves as a primary user interface. The wallet controls access to a user's money, managing keys and addresses, tracking the balance, and creating and assigning transactions. Uh, from a programmer's perspective, the word wallet could refer to a data structure used to store and manage a user's keys. Uh, so in this lecture, we're going to be focusing on how wallets manage and use keys, where wallets are containers for private keys, and they're implemented as structured files or simple databases. So we're going to talk about some of the different technologies that are used to construct user-friendly, secure, and flexible Bitcoin wallets. Uh, just a reminder that uh, Bitcoin wallets don't actually contain Bitcoin. Instead, the wallets contain the keys. The coins are recorded in the blockchain on the Bitcoin network, and users control their coins in the Bitcoin network by signing transactions with the keys in their Bitcoin wallet. So in a sense, the Bitcoin wallet is a keychain of keys that are used to control Bitcoin transactions. So, you know, every user has a wallet, every wallet's you know, going to have one or more keys in it. So you can think of these wallets being keychains containing pairs of these private public keys uh, that we talked about in the previous lecture. Um, users sign transactions using the keys, thereby proving they own the transaction outputs, which are their Bitcoins. The coins are the stored in the blockchain in the form of transaction outputs. Um, and there are two primary kinds of wallets which are referred to as non-deterministic wallets and deterministic wallets. Um, and they're distinguished by whether the keys they contain are related to each other or not. So in a non-deterministic wallet, they're not related to each other. Uh, in a deterministic wallet, the keys are related to each other. So let's start by talking about non-deterministic random wallets. Um, so in a non-deterministic wallet, each key is independently generated from a random number. The keys are not related to each other. Uh, this type of wallet is sometimes referred to as a JBOC or just a bunch of keys uh, wallet. Now, this was the earliest type of wallets that were created. Uh, so in fact, if you look at the... Uh, the original Bitcoin wallet that was created along with the original versions of Bitcoin Core, wallets were collections of randomly generated private keys. So for example, the original Bitcoin Core client created 100 random private keys when it was first started, and it generated more keys when it as needed, um, using each key only once. Uh, those wallets are being replaced with deterministic wallets because the original uh, non-deterministic wallets were very cumbersome to manage, uh, backup, and import. Because you had, uh, in doing an, a backup, you would have to back up every single key. Uh, or to do an import, you'd have to import every single key. Um, and you know each key had to be backed up or the funds it controlled would be lost if, if that wallet became inaccessible. And that conflicted with directly with the principle of avoiding address reuse uh, by using each Bitcoin address for only one transaction, which we'll talk about in a subsequent lecture. So, but address reuse, the reason why I want to avoid that is it'll reduce your privacy because when you associate multiple transactions and addresses with each other, it'll make it much easier to figure out who you are um, and what your transactions are. So one of these original type zero non-deterministic wallets are a poor choice of wallet today, especially given the wide range of technology that's available. Um, although the Bitcoin Core client includes a type zero wallet, using that wallet is, dis is discouraged by developers of Bitcoin Core. Um, 
here is an ex example of what the type zero non-deterministic random wallet uh, looks like. Um, generally speaking, the reason why people uh, still have some of these type zero non-deterministic random wallets around today is just to do, perform simple tests on them. Um, it is not recommended that you actually use it for anything other than uh, do, doing some testing. Instead, our best practices recommendation is that you use a hierarchical deterministic wallet uh, with a nomic random sequence that we'll be talking about um, in one of our later uh, examples, which we're gonna move on to right in a moment. But here you can see a wallet and you can see a bunch of keys with no relationships between the keys. Uh, and again, we're using lowercase uh, k here to refer to private keys. All right, so let's talk about the second type of wallet. Uh, deterministic or seeded wallets are, are wallets that contain private keys that are all derived from a common seed uh, through the use of a one-way hash function. Uh, this seed is a randomly generated number that is combined with other data, such as an index number or a chain code, that arrive the private keys. In a deterministic wallet, the seed is sufficient to recover all the derived keys, and therefore all you need to back up is the seed itself. And then when you want to import, you just import the seed into a new wallet, and that will allow you to obtain all your Bitcoin transactions. Um, so the seeds uh, allows for easy migration of all the user's keys between different uh, wallet implementations. Um, here is a diagram showing um, a type one deterministic seeded wallet. We've got our seed and we can create a sequence of keys, K0, K1, K2, and all the way on down to Kn. And you know, Kn could be millions. So you can generate literally millions of private keys and their associated public keys and addresses from a single seed. And all you would have to do is back up that seed. The most advanced form of deterministic wallets are the HD wallets, uh, hierarchical deterministic wallets uh, that were defined by the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 32 standard. Hierarchical deterministic wallets contain keys uh, that are derived in a tree structure such that a parent key can derive a sequence of children keys, each of which can derive a sequence of grandchildren keys and so on to an infinite depth. Um, so if in a tree structure, one branch can be used for incoming payments, another branch can be used to receive change from outgoing payments. You can also create a sequence of public keys without having access to the corresponding private keys. So here's a look at what a type two HD wall would look like. Um, you've got your seed, your seed generates a master key and then your master key uh, we'll have uh, one or more children and each of those one or more children can have one or more grandchildren. And then you can specialize the purposes of these uh, child keys. Um, you can also use branches of keys for like different departments, uh, different accounting categories, specific functions, subsidiaries and so on. And we'll talk about later how you can use an HD wallet to create a sequence of public keys without having access to the corresponding private keys. And that will allow an HD wallet to be used on in an insecure server or in a receive only capacity, issuing a different public key for each transaction. In that case, the public keys don't need to be preloaded or arrived in advance. And, and the server doesn't have to have the private keys that can spend the funds. So for example, let's suppose you're creating up an uh, e-commerce store and you want to generate a new public key address for every single transaction. Well, you don't have to generate all those addresses while using your private keys. You can put a master public key up on that server and it can generate all of the addresses for the transactions, but then your private keys can be offline and secure uh, hardware storage. And you don't have to worry about a hacker who hacks your website getting access to your private keys. So H hierarchical deterministic wallets are a very uh, powerful technology for managing many different keys and addresses. Uh, they're even more useful if they're combined with a standardized way of creating seeds 
from a sequence of English words that are easy to transcribe, export, and import across wallets. This is known as a monomic, and the standard is defined by Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 39. Uh, today, most Bitcoin wallets, as well as wallets for other cryptocurrencies, use this standard and can import and export seeds for backup and recovery using interoperable monomics. So, you know, if you think about it, what's, uh, what's an easier approach uh, to just transcribe, record on paper, read without error, export and import to either wallet? Uh, this hexadecimal on the left or this 12 word monomic on the right? Uh, both of these actually um, give you essentially the same random number, but the 12 words on the right are a lot easier to handle than this hexadecimal string on the left. Um, you know, because for example, you know, if you're typing out this hexadecimal string, uh, what if, you know, you, you put too many sevens in here? Instead of having three sevens, you have four, you have two, uh, then your hexadecimal string is off. Over here with Army Van Defense, Carry Jealous True, Garbage Claim, Echo Medium, Make and Crunch, we're dealing with 12 words. Um, they're out of, uh, a, there's a dictionary list of about several thousand words to pick from, but each of those words is significantly different from its neighbors. So you're much less likely to run into a problem. Also, we only have to count up 12. Um, so, you know, as opposed to all of the columns here in the hexadecimal approach. Um, so this is a much easier way to create backups on the right versus the backup over here on the left. So as Bitcoin wallet technology has matured, certain common industry standards have emerged that make Bitcoin wallets interoperable, easy to use, secure, and flexible. These common standards include the monomic code, world, code words we just mentioned, which is based on Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 39, hierarchical deterministic wallets based on Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 32, uh, multi-purpose hierarchical deterministic wallet structure, which is based on Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 43, and multi-currency and multi-account wallets based on Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 44. Uh, these standards have been adopted by a broad range of software and hardcore hardware Bitcoin wallets, making all these wallets interoperable. Now, technology changes, and in the future, new standards may be adopted that make some of these standards obsolete, but for now, these standards form a set of interlocking technologies that have become the de facto wallet standard for Bitcoin. Some examples of software wallets supporting these standards include Blue Wallet, Red Wallet, Copay, and Multibit HD. Some examples of hardware wallets include Keep Key, Ledger, and Trezor. Uh, we're gonna dive into each of these technologies in more detail. If you are gonna create your own wallet, you should incorporate these standards. You know, you should build your wallet as an HD wallet based on BIP43. You should use the seed derived from monomic code words using BIP39. Um, and you probably wanna support multiple currencies based on BIP44 uh, and so on. Here's an example of a hardware wallet. Uh, the Trezor is a Bitcoin hardware wallet uh, that can be used to securely manage Bitcoin. Uh, and there are many other Bitcoin wallets out there. I'm not recommending this one. I'm just giving this as an example. Um, you should really pick your own wallet based on what your needs are. Uh, but it's basically a USB device. It's got a couple buttons and you can connect it to a computer. Um, and this hardware device is going to be used to generate your random key that your random number that will become your seed. And then you use the seed to generate all the private keys. And so the treasure will store the private keys. So the private keys are not exposed on your computer where a hacker can get access to it. Uh, this particular hardware wallet implements all the various standards we've mentioned. So when you use a hardware wallet or a software wallet for the very first time, uh, the device is gonna generate a random sequence. Uh, and then the, the monomic based on that random sequence and then, you know, and then derive that, a seed from the built-in hardware random number generator. Uh, during this initialization phase, the wallet displays a numbered sequence of words one by one on the screen. Uh, for example, if you look at this diagram here, um, you know, you'd be writing down all those words, for example, and you'd press the next button and you get the next word. 
And so, for example, you'd write down the seventh word is garbage, and you hit next and go to the next word. Um, and by writing down this phenomenon, you create a backup that you can use for recovery or migrating to any compatible wallet. Now, the sequence is as important as the words because if you get the words out of order, uh, it'll actually end up in resulting in a separate master key, which will result in not finding the Bitcoin you stored in the other in the other sequence. Um, so it's important when you're writing down the words, also write down the number next to it. So for example, if you're writing down on a blank piece of paper, you would put like seven dot garbage. So here, for example, is a back uh, a backup of the monomic. In this particular case, it's a 12 word monomic. Uh, Army van defense, carry jealous true, garbage claim echo, medium making crunch. Nowadays, most wallets will generate a 24 word monomic, but it'll work identically to how the 12 word work, monomic works. It's just a little harder uh, for hackers to try and break 24 words than it would be for 12 words. Uh, well, significantly harder. Um, so uh, we can actually go take a look at the word list. Um, you can see here at this link, uh, we've got the English version of the BIP39 word list. Um, So here's the GitHub uh, for Bitcoin and it lists a BIP39 English list. So you can see here, for example, the first words abandon followed by ability and a bit able. Um, and you'll notice that although the first couple letters, AB and ABI are, uh, you know, AB is the same. Um, and then about and above, you got ABO being the same. But usually there's only about three letters that are the same. And then the second half of the word, like about has UT, above has VE. Those are different. To make it relatively easy to tell these words apart, to minimize the risk of a typo causing you to lose your Bitcoin. Uh, a single letter typo will not be a problem. Um, now, if you've got a multi-letter typo, then that can be an issue. Um, and there's about 2,000 words in here. Okay, so returning to our slides here, um, there are significant differences between the words on the list. Um, as I mentioned, I showed you the differences between about and above. And those are about as close as the words get, uh, where you've got three letters same and only a couple of letters different. So let's talk about how these words are generated. Um, so basically, monomic code words are word sequences that essentially represent a random number used as a seed to derive our deterministic wallet. The sequence of words is sufficient to recreate the seed and from there recreate the wallet and all the derived private keys that are based on that wallet. So a wallet application that implements deterministic wallets with monomic words is going to show the user a sequence of, of words when first creating that wallet. That sequence of words is a wallet backup and can be used to recover and recreate all the keys in the same or any compatible wallet application. And as we said, it's a lot easier to remember those things. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind is the monomic words here are not the same thing as a brain wallet. A brain wallet is where a user picks some words. Here, however, our monomic words are generated randomly, so a user does not select what the words are. And because they're selected randomly, they are far more secure uh, because human beings in general are a poor source of randomness. So you would not want to use words that a person selects. So there are different standards besides BIP39 for implementing monomic code words, but BIP39 is the primary one that the industry tends to be using. Um, so let's walk through the steps that are used to generate a monomic code uh, and follow these particular steps. Okay, so the first step is, and, and by the way, again, this is all done automatically by the computer uh, that's inside your wallet. Uh, which you know, may be a hardware wallet or a software wallet. So the wallet has some kind of source of randomness, okay? Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, whatever that source of entropy it is, it then is going to start with that randomness 
it'll add a checksum to that randomness and then it'll map the entropy to a word list. You know, checksum is there to make sure that your uh, random number doesn't get modified. And if something does modify it, you can verify or identify that has been tampered with. All right, so our first step is we create a random number of 128 to 256 bits, depending on how long of a random number you want. Um, and if it's 128 bits, you know, that'd be a 12 word uh, sequence. If it's gonna be 256 bits, then that's gonna be a 24 word sequence. All right, so we decide what we're going for um, and we create this random number. Um, so over here on the diagram, we got generate entropy and we're just gonna show you for 128 bits here. All right, the next step is we're gonna create a checksum of the random number by, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hash that number um, using SHA-26. So remember, SHA-26 is a one-way hash function. So this will give us a 256-bit hash of that 128-bit number. All right, now the hash is you know, actually gonna be larger than the 128-bit number, that's the way it goes. Um, now in this particular case, we're not actually gonna save all of the hash. We're just gonna save the first four bits of that 256-bit hash, and those four bits become our checksum. And then we append that checksum in step three to the end of our random number. So we had a 128-bit number and we added four bits. Now we have 132 bits. The next step is we're gonna take that 132-bit number and we're gonna cut it into 12 numbers that are 11 bits each. All right, so now we've got these 12 numbers that we're indicating by these dashed lines, or these 12 segments uh, that we're indicating by these dashed lines. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that 11 bit number and we're gonna map, and remember, um, you know, if you think about it, it's 11 bit number, so that means it's 11 zeros and ones. And we're gonna map it into our 2000 words. Um, another way to think about, so, you know, if you look at this here for a moment, um, all zeros, if we got all zeros in our 11 bit number, that'll give us the word abandon. If we got all zeros followed by one, that'll give us the word ability all, all the way down to, if we got all ones, we'll have zoo. So our 2000 words maps perfectly in to our um, 11 bit segment. All right, so based on what those random numbers are, we now have 11 words like army, van, defense, carry, jealous, true, garbage, claim, echo, media, make, and crunch in our example. And so this monomic code is the sequence of those words. Now, the reason why it's important to keep these words in order is because that way you know the order of the 12 segments of 11 bits. You know, these are essentially 12 random numbers that when we uh, pen them together, produce our, our, our random entropy followed by the checksum. So what would happen if someone was trying to recreate the wallet and they had gotten one of these words wrong? Well, if you get one of these words wrong, then you've got the wrong bits, uh, wrong bit sequence uh, that is mapping to that word. And therefore, when you try to verify the checksum with the entropy, they will not match. And you'll get an error message and uh, you'll realize something went wrong and you better go check your word sequence again. So here's a look um, at the relationship between uh, the size of the entropy data and the length of monomic codes and words. Um, in general, the monomic words represent entropy between 128 bits and 256 bits. Um, so, you know, with 128 bits, we're dealing with 12 words, with 256, we're dealing with 24 words. And you can have, a, um, if you want to do some number of words in between the two, you can have a um, you know, variable amount of, of entropy, random number based on that. Now, as the um, length of the entropy increases, the length of the checksum increases slightly, um, and it, your, your bits gets a little larger. Um, All right, so let's talk a little bit more about what's going, before we dive into next what happens, I wanna talk about a couple other cryptography technologies that we're gonna use. 
Uh, and the first one is a hash-based message, message authentication code. Uh, HMAC SHA-512 is used by Bitcoin. It's a specific type of message authentication code involving a cryptographic hash function and a secret key. As with other message authentication codes, it can be used to verify both the data integrity and the authentication of a message. So it provides message authentication using a shared secret instead of using digital signatures uh, with asymmetric cryptography. Uh, and so basically, typically what you do is you have this iterative hash function that breaks up a message into blocks of a fixed size and iterates over them with a compression function. The size of the output of HMAC is the same as that of the underlying hash function, in this case, SHA-512, although you can truncate it. Uh, HMAC does not encrypt the message. Instead, the message, whether or not it's encrypted, is sent alongside the HMAC hash, and then parties who have the secret key will hash the message again, and they'll verify that the received and computed hashes match. You know, basically, it's a message code that goes along with the message, kind of similar to what we just saw, um, and then you can verify that the message hasn't been modified because when you recompute the message authentication code, you, the recomputed one matches the one that was sent. Now, another cryptographic technology we're going to use in Bitcoin along with HMAC 512 is something that's referred to as a password based key, der key derivation function. And in particular, we're using PPKDF2. Uh, so, pa this uh, password based key derivation function 2 is a key derivation function with a sliding computational cost that can be used to reduce vulnerabilities to brute force attacks. Uh, a brute force attack is essentially where someone computes a whole bunch of passwords and attempts to uh, see if one of those passwords will work against um, your password. So for example, someone might take all of the English words in the dictionary, um, you know, several thousand words, and compute what the password is for, for each one, and then check to see if you chose an English word for your password. Uh, so PP, and so in order to reduce vulnerabilities to brute force attacks, we have this password-based key derivation function, which I'll explain how that works. Uh, basically what it does is it uses a pseudo random function. In this case, it uses the HMAC SHA-512 we just talked about, uh, you know, as along with an input password or passphrase along with a salt value and it will hash the inputs many many times thousands of times to produce a derived key which then can be used as a cryptographic key in subsequent operations the added computational work of hashing it thousands of times makes password cracking much more difficult and this is sometimes referred to as key stretching uh, and so basically what you would do is, you know, your derived key, you know, after you run through this function, uh, takes several inputs. You've got a, a particular message authentication algorithm. In this case, we're using HMAC SHA-512. You have your original password, you have a salt, uh, the number of iterations you want to run through it, which is usually a th several thousand, um, and then what the length of the key is supposed to be once you create the, uh, the final key. Uh, okay. So how, uh, what are we actually doing now? Well, at this point, you know, going back to our original diagram from a couple of slides ago, um, step six, we created these 12 words. Now, what do we do with those 12 words? So these 12 words, again, represent a certain amount of random number, uh, which could be anywhere between 128 to 256 bits in length, based on whether or not we're talking about, um, you know, 12 words, 24 words. Then we're going to take that random number and we're going to generate a longer 512 bit seed using this key stretching function, P P password based key derivation function. So our monomic words random number is basically our password we're passing into here. But then we're going to generate this longer 512 bit seed using that key stretching function. That seed produced is then used to build your deterministic wallet and derive all the keys. And so the key stretching function takes two parameters, the, the random number, which is 128 to bits length in uh, randomness in the monomic and a salt. The salt in the key stretching function uh, makes it difficult, uh, is another way to make it difficult to build a lookup table enabling a brute force attack uh, and essentially serving as a passphrase. So here we go. Um, we've got um, our next, 
set of steps here. Uh, you've got your monomic code words. You know, in this case, we've got Army Van Defense, which is representing this 128-bit bit entropy randomness. And our second parameter is coming in is the salt, which is either this word monomic, uh, or if you have a password, uh, you would have your password here. So basically, when you are creating your wallet, you have the option uh, as part of creating the wallet, the, uh, the UI, the user interface will ask you, hey, do you want to create a passphrase? And if you do create a passphrase, that passphrase will be passed in here as part of the salt right here. Then what we do is both of these are now pasted it into our password based key derivation function using HMAC SHA 512. And in this particular case, they're going to run it 2048 times. Um, and then the final output is going to be this 512 bit seed. Uh, here we're showing that 512 bit seed in hexadecimal. Um, but again, as a person who's using a wallet, you'll never actually see this 512 bit seed. This will all be hidden in the computer program. What you'll see is these list of words. Um, this key structuring function with its 2000 rounds of hashing is an effective protection against brute force attacks uh, against the monomic or the pair of passphrase. It makes it very costly in computation to try more than a few thousand passphrase or monomic combinations, while the number of possible derived seeds is extremely large, um, you know, two to the 512. So here's a couple examples. All right, so again, um, you start off with, you've got your random number, 128 bits that we're gonna describe in words. So here we've got that random number in hexadecimal address in hexadecimal form, zero, C1, E24, and so on. Um, so then we get, we produce from that 12 words, the Army Van Defense example we've seen so far. Now this particular case, let's assume we're not gonna enter in a password. You know, when, when it, the wallet asks us for a password, we say no. So our seed is this, um, you know, 512 bits based on that, we got 5B, 56, C41, blah, 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 blah. All right. So that's an example of, you know, 128 bit entropy without using a passphrase. Now let's suppose we wanted to use a passphrase. So in this case, we enter in the password super duper secret and, you know, the first couple steps are identical, but now we get a completely different seed uh, because you, you're hashing in this new passphrase and it changes the hash output completely. Um, you know, before we had 5B56C4, now we've got 3B5DF, whatever. It's a completely different hexadecimal number. Another example here, we've got a 24 word uh, monomic because we're doing a 256 bit uh, random number. Um, and again, no password. And, but again, our seed is only gonna be 512 bits. Uh, but again, it's completely different. So depending on the wallet you're dealing with will determine whether the wallet prefers 12 or 24 words. Uh, some wallets will ask you, um, some wallets uh, will not. Um, some people argue that the extra entropy from 24 words is unnecessary um, and that um, that unused and, and that the extra entropy doesn't do much uh, to protect your wallet. Um, and they also argue that writing down 12 words is more effective than writing down 24 words. Um, so there are, there are some arguments as to whether or not you really need 24 words or not. Um, because the seed size, the final seed side will remain the same at 512 bits. So let's talk about this optional passphrase for a minute. So the BIP39 standard allows the use of an optional passphrase in the derivation of the seed. If no passphrase is used, the monomic is stretched with salt consisting of the constant word monomic producing a specific 512-bit C from any given monomic. If a passphrase is used, the stretching function produces a different C from that same monomic. Um, so in fact, they, uh, given a single monomic, every possible passphrase will lead to a different C. 
Uh, you know, so essentially there could be no wrong passphrases to pick. All passphrases would be valid and they all lead to different seeds forming a vast set of possible uninitialized wallets. The set of possible wallets is so large that there's no practical possibility of brute forcing or accidentally guessing one that is in use. Um, the optional passphrase creates several important features. One approach is, you know, it gives you a second factor, you know, which is something memorized that makes a monomic useless on its own, uh, protecting monomic backups from compromise by a thief. So let's say you back up your monomic, you put it in a, a safe in your house and someone robs the safe. Well, even though they stole the monomic, uh, they don't have the password and so now they, it's useless to them. Um, a second approach is a sort of plausible deniability or duress wallet approach, where you have two passwords, one password unlocks a wallet with a very small amount of money. And the second wallet uh, password gives you uh, the real funds. However, there are drawbacks to using a passphrase. Um, you know, if the wallet owner is incapacitated or dead or has forgotten the passphrase, then the monomic is useless and all the funds stored in the wallet are lost forever. Um, and if the owner backs up the passphrase in the same place where the monomic is located, then it defeats the purpose of having that passphrase. So while passphrases are useful, they should only be used in combination with a, a plan process for backup and recovery, considering the possibility of surviving the owner and allowing his or her family to recover any cryptocurrency. Um, there are a number of libraries for implementing all of these Bitcoin improvement proposals that we talked about um, in various different languages like Python, Java, JavaScript, C++, and so on. Let's talk about creating an HD hierarchical deterministic wallet from the seed. So HD wallets are created from a single root seed, which is typically either a 128, 256, or 512 bit random number. Uh, most commonly, the seed is generated from monomic, as we talked about in the previous section. We're generating this 512 uh, seed from a monomic. Every key in the hierarchical deterministic wallet is deterministically derived from this root seed, which makes it possible to recreate the entire hierarchical deterministic wallet from that seed in any compatible hierarchical deterministic wallet. This makes it easy to back up, restore, export, and import HD wallets containing thousands or even millions of keys by simply transferring only monomic that the root seed is derived from. So the process of creating a root seed, uh, the master keys and master chain code for a hierarchical deterministic wallet is shown in this diagram. Um, so we start off with, uh, we've got our cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator that helps us create our code words. Then we, you generate your root seed from that. And then we're going to pass this into um, a HMAC uh, SHA 512 hash operator uh, algorithm. And then we're going to use that 512 uh, bit output to produce um, a master private key and a master chain code. Uh, basically, we've produced a 512 bit output and the left. 256 bits of that 512 is going to become our private key. And the right 256 bits of that 512 is going to become our chain code. And then what we use our private key is we um, use the normal elliptic curve multiplication process to take that private key and generate our public key and uh, to have a master public key. So at this point, we've now created a master private key, a master public key, and a master ch chain code. So hierarchical deterministic wallets use a child key derivation function to derive the child keys from the parent keys. Uh, the child key derivation functions are essentially a one-way hash function that combines a parent, private, or public key, a seed called a chain code, and an index number. The left half of the resulting hash are added to the parent private key to produce a child private key. The right half 
of the resulting hash becomes the child chain code, chain code. And we use that to generate additional children. The uh, chain code is used to introduce deterministic random data to the process. So knowing the index in a child key is not sufficient to derive other child keys. Knowing a child key does not make it possible to find its siblings unless you also have the chain code. The initial chain code seed at the root of the tree is made from the seed, while subsequent chain, child chain codes are derived from each parent chain code. So these three items, the parent key, the chain code, and the index are combined and hashed to generate all the children keys. So here we take a look at how that works. Uh, you've got your parent public key, you've got your uh, parent private key, we've got a parent chain code and our index number. We've got this HMAC SHA-512 function here. Uh, again, it's a one-way hash function. Um, and it produces a 512-bit output from these three inputs, the parent public key, chain code, and index number. And the results of that uh, will become, you know, we'll split that up. So 256 bits uh, and the parent private key combined to generate the private key of the child. Uh, and the right 26 bits combines to create the child's chain code. Um, and then again, we use the normal elliptic curve algorithms to go from parent private key to parent public key and from child private key to child public key. So, and then changing the index number will allow you to extend the parent and create the other children in a sequence. So for example, let's suppose that I wanted to have um, a tree where I have one parent key and lots of children, then I would just iterate the index number for every additional child you wanna create. Uh, up to like 2 billion, each parent key can have up to 2 billion children, which will be two to 31 based on those 32 bits. Um, then, um, and then of course, you can also have grandchildren. Each child could have its own two, bill, two uh, billion children. So you can have plenty of keys based off of a single root key. So again, using these derived child keys, um, a hacker, even if they learn the child key, can't figure out what the parent key is. They can't figure out what the sibling keys are. Only the parent key and the chain code can be used to derive all the children. Um, and you need both the child private key and the child chain code to create grandchildren keys. Um, and a child private key can be used to make a public key and a Bitcoin address. Then it can be used to sign transactions to spend anything paid to that address. So you wanna keep your chain code secret and you wanna keep your root key, uh, your parent master, master private key secret. Uh, so why are we creating all these child private keys? So that we can uh, make public keys and Bitcoin addresses and use them in transactions. And these child private keys, the corresponding public keys and addresses are all indistinguishable from keys and addresses created randomly. Um, you know, these are essentially pseudo random but they're indistinguishable from truly random. And the fact that they are not part of a sequence isn't, isn't visible outside of the HD wallet function that created them. Once created, they operate exactly as normal keys. So let's talk about extended keys. So the key derivation function can be used to create children at any level of the tree based on these three inputs, a key, a chain code, and the index of the desired child. The two essential ingredients are the key and the chain code, and combined, these are called an extended key. Uh, you could also think of this as an extensible key because such a key can be used to derive children. Extended keys are stored and represented as a concatenation of the 256-bit key and the 256-bit chain code into a 512-bit sequence. There are two types of extended keys. An extended private key is a combination of a private key and chain code and can be used to derive child private keys. And then you can derive, you know, from the child private keys, you public keys. An extended public key is a public key and chain code, which can be used to create child public keys, uh, as we'll talk about in a little bit when we talk about public key derivation. 
Um, think of an extended key as the root of a branch in the tree structure of the Hereford deterministic wallet. With the root of the branch, you can derive the rest of the branch. The extended private key can create a complete branch, whereas the extended public key can only create a branch of public keys. Extended keys are encoded using base 58 check, uh, similar to addresses, uh, so that they're easy to export and import between different uh, Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 32 compatible wallets. The base 58 check uh, coding for extended keys uses a special version number that results in the prefix xprev or xpub when it's coded in base 58 characters uh, to make them easily recognizable. Uh, as a private extended private key or as extended public key. Because the extended key is 512 or 513 bits, it's much longer than other base 58 encoded strings we've seen previously. So it'll be pretty obvious it's not an address. Um, so let's talk about public key derivation. As mentioned previously, a very useful characteristic of Heracle deterministic wallets is the ability to derive public keys from public parent keys without having the private keys. This gives us two ways to derive a child public key, either from the child private key or directly from the parent public key. So an extended public key can be used to derive all the public keys and only the public keys in that branch of the HD wallet structure. This shortcut can be used to create very secure public key only deployments where a server or application has a copy of an extended public key and no private keys whatsoever. That kind of deployment can produce an infinite number of public keys and Bitcoin addresses, but can't spend any of the money sent to those addresses. Meanwhile, on another more secure server, the extended private key can derive all the corresponding private keys to sign transactions and spend the money. Uh, one common application of this solution is to install an extended public key in a web server that serves as an e-commerce application. The web server can use the public key derivation function to create a new Bitcoin address for every transaction. So for example, for every customer shopping cart. The web server won't have any private keys that'll be vulnerable to theft uh, because all we're putting on there is uh, public keys. Without HD wallets, the only way to do this is to generate, if we didn't have HD wallets, the only way to do this would be to generate thousands of Bitcoin addresses separately and then load them. That approach is pretty cumbersome and requires a lot of maintenance and therefore HD wallets uh, works great. Another common application of this approach is to um, use them with cold storage or hardware wallets. In that approach, the extended private key can be stored on a hardware device, uh, such as uh, a Trezor or Ledger hardware device, uh, while the extended public key can be kept online. The user can create receive addresses at will while the private keys are safely stored offline and to spend the funds, the user can then use the extended private key on an offline signing Bitcoin client or sign transactions on the hardware wallet device. Here's a look at how this public key derivation works. We've got our parent public key. We've got our parent chain code. We've got index number. The public key and the chain code are passed into your HMAC SHA-512 uh, hash function and it produces your child public key and your child index chain code. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty similar to what we we're seeing with private keys, except now we're not exposing the private keys at all. Uh, we're just exposing the public keys on this, you know, on this web server or whatever this uh, more vulnerable server is. Now, another approach to uh, how we can use these HD wallets is hardened child key derivation. Um, you know, the ability to derive a bunch of public keys, as we showed above, is pretty useful, but it comes with potential risks. Access to um, an XPUB uh, extensible public key doesn't give access to child private keys. However, because the XPUB contains a child co chain code, if someone knows a child private key somehow, or if it's somehow leaked, it could be used with that chain code to derive the other child private keys. So a single leak child private key together with the chain code could reveal private keys of other children. Uh, Worse, the child private key together with parent chain code might be used to deduce the parent private key. So to counter this risk, careful deterministic wallets have an alternative derivation function that's referred to as hardened derivation. 
which breaks the relationship between the parent public key and the child chain code. Uh, this hardened derivation function uses the parent private key to derive the child chain code instead of the parent public key. This creates a firewall in the parent child sequence with a chain code that can't be used to compromise a parent or sibling private key. The hardened derivation function looks similar to the normal child private key derivation, except that the parent private key is used as an input to the hash function instead of the public key. So here we take a look at how that works. So before I had my public key, my chain code, my index number being passed in the HMAX child 512. Now we have the parent private key being passed in. And you know we are computing a public key, but we're not having that involved with the HMAC at all. Um, and therefore, it makes it significantly harder to uh, hack into the private key. However, if you do this, you cannot um, derive the public keys that I was talking about uh, with the web server scenario, uh, because that requires the public key to be part of the uh, one of the inputs to the HMAC function. So when the hardened private uh, derivation function is used, the resulting child public key and chain code are completely different from what would result from the normal derivation function. The resulting branch of keys can be used to produce extended public keys that are not vulnerable because the chain code they contain cannot be exploited to reveal any private keys. Hardened derivation is therefore used to create a gap in the tree above the level where extended public keys are used. Um, so if you want the convenience of an XPUB to derive branches of public keys without exposing yourself to the risk of a cha link chain code, you should derive it from a hardened parent key uh, rather than a normal parent key. Um, as a best practice, the level one children of the master keys are always derived through the hardened derivation to prevent compromise of the master keys. So let's talk about index numbers. Um, the index number used in the derivation function is a 32-bit in integer. To easily distinguish between keys derived through the normal derivation function versus keys derived through hardened derivation, this index number is split into two ranges. Uh, index numbers between 0 and 2 to 31 minus 1 are used only for normal derivation. Index numbers between 2 to the 31 and 2 to the 32 minus 1 are used only for hardened derivation. Um, therefore, if the index number is less than 231, you know it's normal. Otherwise, you know that it's hardened. To make the index number easier to read and display, the index number for hardened children is displayed starting from zero but for prime symbol. The first normal child is therefore displayed as zero, and the first hardened child is displayed as zero prime. In sequence, then, the second hardened key would be uh, you know, one prime, and the second normal child would be one. Keys in a hierarchical determinism wallet are identified using a path naming convention. With each level, the tree is separated by a slash character. Private keys derived from the master private key start with an M. Uh, that's lowercase. Public keys derived from the master public key start with capital M. So the first child private key of the master private key would be master slash zero. The first child public key would be capital M slash zero. Uh, the second grandchild of the first child would be master zero one uh, and so on. Uh, and then you can read the ancestry of a key from right to left until you reach the master key from which it was derived. So here are several examples. So for example, the first example is M slash zero which refers to the first child private key from the master private key, which is lowercase m. Um, the last example down here, we've got M231700. So that's the first child public key from the first child, from the 18th child, from the 24th child. And remember, zero is the first. And so 17 is 17 plus one, so that's the 18th. And 23 is 23 plus one, that's 24th. Uh, and this is a capital M, so this is all public keys. Um, and again, this one in the middle with the M zero prime zero, this is a normal child that was derived from a hardened child that was derived from the master private key. So that's just some examples of how you could read the key identifiers in an HD wallet.
most of the time you're never going to read it by other, as those identifiers but if you had to that's how you would do it navigating the hierarchical deterministic wall tree structure so an extended key can have up to four billion children and every one of those four billion children can have another four billion billion children that's a lot of potential children um you know so how does your wallet immediately identify how much Bitcoin you have? If it's got to surf through all these potential uh, children to find the real keys that are in use. Uh, you know, and that would also make it difficult when you're transferring to a, uh, between implementations of wallets uh, because of possibilities for internal organization and the branches and sub branches uh, are you know, almost infinite. So there's two Bitcoin improvement proposals that offer a solution to this complexity by creating some standards for how HD wallet trees should be structured. Bitcoin improvement proposal 43 proposes the use of the first hardened child index as a special identifier that signifies the purpose of the tree structure. So based on BIP 43, an HD wallet should use only one level one branch of the tree with the index number identifying the structure and namespace of the rest of the tree by defining its purpose. Uh, for example, an HD wallet using a, uh, you know, that might have a special purpose associated with the index number I. Uh, extending that specification, BIP44 proposes a multi-account structure as purpose uh, following the BIP44 structure. So you might have um, you know, private key, purpose, coin type, account, change, index, in, address index, and so on. Um, and they actually, so as you can see here in this little diagram down here with these five predefined tree levels. Uh, so for example, um, the coin type would specify the type of cryptocurrency. So for example, whether you're using Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or something else. Uh, or te our testnet, testnet Bitcoin currency. Um, the account would allow users to subdivide their wallets into separate logical subaccounts for accounting or organizational purposes. Uh, you might have multiple Bitcoin accounts. On the change part, you might have subtrees where you are creating receiving addresses uh, for uh, and a subtree for creating change addresses. Um, and you might decide not to use hardened derivation when you're creating the change addresses because you want to be able to publish those. Um, and then the address index might be dealing with all the various addresses. So let's take a look at, um, Yeah, we talked about that. Uh, here's some examples. Uh, you know, here we've got again the public key uh, 44 prime zero prime zero prime zero two. So this would be the third receiving public key for a primary Bitcoin account. Uh, over here, master key. You know, all these 44s, by the way, has to do with the fact that they're using BIP 44. Uh, presumably, at some point in the future, if there's a new Bitcoin improvement proposal that changes the wallet key structure. Uh, it might be, you know, BIP 200 or whatever, and then they would have a different number in that first line to represent the fact that we're following a different standard there. Um, but again, you could use this second middle example here for a 15th change address for our fourth of our Bitcoin accounts. And this one here in the middle, it's actually dealing with a Litecoin account. Uh, which is what this two uh, prime is referring to is it's uh, a different cryptocurrency entirely. All right, so we could create an extended public key on a web store, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, uh, someone can set up a web store as a hobby based on a simple web price, web, a WordPress page. Um, and then what you could do is, you know, um, use this extended public key approach to generate as many public keys as you need uh, for the incoming transactions as you create a shopping cart on your simple website. Um, there are a number of different applications out there that make it easy to plug into Bitcoin. For example, um, 
Here's an example of one, which is BTC Pay Server. It's an open source web store for a variety of web hosting and content platforms. It uses an XPUB to generate a unique address for every purchase. Um, and then you can use a hardware wallet like Trezor or Ledger and so on. And then the hardware wallet will keep all the private keys, uh, whereas the, you know, the BTC, pay, BTC Pay Server is only going to have your public keys on it. And here's an example of doing that. We we're exporting an export from our hardware wallet so that we can then put it into the BCP, BTC Pay Server. And so uh, generally most wallets will give you both uh, the public key that you can then copy and paste, as well as a QR version that you could read in and bring that in uh, from your wallet. And then you can put that on your website. Um, and again, um, even if a hacker hacks your website and gets a hold of the public key, they won't be able to figure out the private keys to get the Bitcoin funds. So let's talk about account discovery and management. Um, importing a wallet with used and unused addresses would require a search to find all of the transaction history and balance. Um, as there's literally billions of children keys potentially that can be created by a wallet, it could be difficult to search for funds in a huge hierarchical tree. So instead, most wallets are gonna follow an iterative process that have a predefined place to where to search for public keys and private keys known as a gap limit. While searching, if the wallet doesn't find any used addresses in a row beyond the limit number, it will stop searching that particular chain of addresses. The default is 20, but you can increase it to um, whatever number you prefer to increase it to uh, when you're doing imports. And so gap limits explain the phenomenon where when you're importing a wallet, you may see an incorrect or zero balance. The funds aren't lost, but rather the wallet input porting function hasn't traversed enough leaves to fully detect the funds. Uh, many wallets allow this default limit to be changed. And so if you do see missing Bitcoin when you're doing an import, change your gap limit to see if you uh, find the, the missing transactions. So um, this video and these slides are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike International License. Um, and this slide deck includes content from the Mastering Bitcoin GitHub site by Andreas, uh, located at github.com Bitcoin book. Uh, and those materials on, on there uh, were made available under this license by Andreas. And I want to thank him for that. Um, and I want to thank everyone for watching this video on Bitcoin wallets and how Bitcoin wallets manage uh, private keys and public keys and addresses. Um, and tune in next time for the next lecture in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett.